In the last episode, we recounted our unlikely encounter with paleobotanist Cindy, Ivo, Ben and Antoine, who are studying life as it was on Earth 300 million years ago. Our scientists are studying coal balls, fossils so well preserved that you can see individual cells from the prehistoric plants. They have just stumbled upon what is probably the first and only big data set known about these fossils, but it is locked in all the 8-inch floppies from the IBM 360 era. They asked us if we could help them recover it, and of course we said yes. So let's go back a few weeks. Antoine was in town, so I invited the whole crew for a first meeting. I wasn't planning on doing any work and didn't shoot any videos. But as things got unexpectedly interesting, they fortunately took a few cell phone snippets. This is what this video is mostly made of. After we briefly played with the Xerox Alto and punched a few cars, we went on to lunch where they started to explain what they were doing. By the time we were back in the lab, we were all really fired up and started to dig into the reams of data and formulate a plan. Which would obviously mean bringing up an 8-inch floppy drive, which I hadn't done yet. The 8-inch floppy was invented at IBM Almaden in Silicon Valley, down the road from us in the late 1960s, under the leadership of famed Alan Sugart. The first drive, the 23FD, introduced in 1971, was a read-only device and was used by service engineers to load firmware on this rather nondescript IBM 2835 storage unit controller. But in 1973, a second version was introduced, the 33FD, which was both read and write. It was first shipped in the revolutionary IBM 3741 data station. The station was not a computer, it was a data entry system that replaced the earlier key punch used up to then for data entry on punch cards. One 250 kilobyte disk could go as much as 3000 punch cards. You would then create a tape from many disks in the IBM 3747 converter and hand over the tape to the IBM 360 or 370 mainframe people. This is probably what we have here, the first read-write 8-inch floppy format that existed, produced on an IBM 3471 data station. We are living at the bleeding edge of 1973 technology. Antoine had already been thinking ahead and he came prepared with an old 8-inch floppy drive that he had purchased on eBay. What if we try to connect it? Maybe we'd get lucky. I am already fairly well set up for 5 and a quarter inch floppy drive work in any weird format. I'm using my old Dolch, some creative cabling and some DOS software that lets me poke at non-IBM disks at the lowest level, as I have shown in a previous series of videos. So old floppies are a cabling nightmare, but I already solved it for the 5 inch, so you have that would be the modern interface with the IDC cable, but most old floppies will have that 34 pin edge connector. But sure enough, the 8 inch uh, discs have a different connector, it's a 50 pin edge connector, uh, which fortunately can be reduced to the 34 pins, it's just a wider connector, doesn't have any more signals. Well, as you'll see in a future video, this is actually not quite true. Let's just say that for a reasonably modern iteration of an 8-inch drive, you can get away by only using the signals present on the 34-pin connector. And I'm sure there is a ready-made converter adapter cable uh, available from somewhere, but we didn't have much time, wanted to do it right away, so I ended up with the Alto uh, adapter from uh, edge connector to 50-pin IDC that goes into my quickly hacked adapter to 34 pin IDC and as you can see it's not that straightforward there's a lot of uh, twisting and reshuffling involved that then plugs into the Dolch which I had or already adapted and goes into the regular five and a quarter inch floppy drive and off we go we are connected to make our life more difficult, this drive required both a 5 volt and a 24 volt supply at pretty healthy amperage. But eventually we got ready for the first test. This failed. Failed. Okay, <laughs> so, uh... The drive powered up and the BIOS did not recognize it, which was expected. 
We were soon able to turn the drive motor on and off from Omnidisc and to seek to specific tracks. So it looked like my hacked cable worked properly and we communicated with the drive. We configured Omnidisc for the earliest IBM 360 format for track sector and modulation information and felt brave enough to try to read a disc. Yeah, it's blinking now. That's, that's the index, I'm guessing. Okay. Yeah. It didn't shred it. I'm guessing that's the index. Yeah. Box, which is good. Five zero yeah. map. Ooh. On. Good sign. Yay! The drive spun our precious disc without shredding it. The next step was to scan each track to see if we could recognize the modulation format and determine the sector information. <laughs> or is it reading anything? I don't even know if this is FM compatible, so... Yeah, that's one of the points. Nothing well. detected. Yeah. Oh, it's FM. Oh, FM, it did, it did find out. It can do FM. Head 1, read 3, nothing detected. Well, well sure enough, we read absolutely nothing. So it quickly degenerated into one of our usual debugging sessions. I noticed that the drive seemed to spin too slowly and also the power consumption on the 48 volt rail seemed excessive. The motor was a brushless motor with an electronic drive. We decided to instrument the motor's drive circuitry and quickly zeroed in on a power transistor that wasn't switching properly. Our paleontologist did not film the exciting process of finding our faulty part I really wonder why, but for the curious, it was transistor Q4, right there. Fortunately, I had almost an exact replacement in my vintage collection, so we did a little transistor transplant. We repaired this, well, we think we repaired this drive. We, we have a disk drive, we hook it up, it sort of worked, but not full speed. And then we replaced a, f a faulty component, a transistor in the end. And if I get my wires correct, we hope that it's going to repair this wire. By the way, this is not the first repair transistor. This one was repaired also. Oh, was it? Yep, I can tell. Oh. So I'm a little worried that there's something else that makes the, the thing fail. Uh, okay, Antoine, yep. you have to repair your thing for the best mm -hmm. we can. Let's do it. Okay. Yeah, it's been happening now. Yep. All right, much better. The disc appears to spin at the right speed. Oh, oh it's reading <laughs> our data. <laughs> and that's, that's, it that's zero. Yeah, yeah. It's only on one side. So right, so yeah. it's it's reading data. Yep. So it's reading the sector, so you know it's... Um, what the heck is he doing? 25, 26 sectors. Oh, the, is it, is it, isn't it what it's saying on the... What was uh, on the other floppy? Yeah. yeah, I think it was it. But it, it's reading all the uh, all the sectors. R right now, I'm just reading. Six sectors, uh, 128 bytes. Well, uh, uh, it tells me it's correct. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we repaired it. This is very good news. We can now map the floppy. Omnidisc confirms it can identify a single-sided 77 tracks, 26 sectors, 128 bits per sectors FM encoded disk. And that, my friend, would indeed be the earliest and original IBM 3470 floppy format. So now that we have uh, confirmed the settings, we are go for data recovery and we are trying at fir our first pass at uh, dumping the content of the disk. Oh, that's the end. Oh, yep. That's the end of the record. Cool. I did it. Wow. Well, it's, it's, it's all, as all the... All the same data all the time. There's something. So I wonder... We need an X editor. Are these any problems? No, at the end of the day, we actually recover data that makes absolutely no sense. Uh, but it turns out it's because we were reading it in ASCII and it was EPSIDIC, it was IBM speak. So when Antoine later went back to Paris or the university, I don't know, and then <laughs> reread it in EPSIDIC, say, oh, that's actually the data that we were looking for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good story. So I must have been a little tired at the end of the day. And so this is our raw data and it didn't look like it made much sense. But 
if uh, we click the hex button right there and now it looks nicely organized so there is definitely something to it in retrospect it's pretty obvious what this is and further proof that it's from an IBM 3471 machine this is simply 80 columns of epsidic characters the exact width of the punch cards the system was emulating padded with zeros to make it fit on the 128 byte long floppy sector and you can see some data in the beginning and uh, what's happening is that it's just in the wrong encoding so it's 1960 or 1970 it's IBM there is no ASCII it's talking IBM coding it's talking EPSIDIC uh, the, the, the coding derived from punch cards so I transfer it to EPSIDIC and voila, now it looks like something. If we move in, and we have a lot of it actually. And if we move to the top, there's Sahara. So this is the name for the tome, uh, probably where the, the cobalt comes from. So if we do a little bit of editing here, let me try this line down here and zap that one out. Go replace it with a cash return and voila, here's our data. This is volume one of the Sahara 4 disks. And right away, we saw that the markings on the outside of the boxes here, so that you can see here, this says uh, 11, that refers to the floppy disk, and then Sahara 4, part two. Um, Sahara we recognize right away as being a locality, an area where cobalts were collected. And not only that, but a locality that we had data tomes for. We had these paper data sheets for. And so this overlap was immediately interesting. And then the four will refer to a vertical section, so an area of collection, right? So these, this name is structured in the same way as the data in these data tomes. So right away we were very excited thinking that this might be a digital record. Um, that we thought had been completely lost or perhaps had never existed at all. Bingo! There you have it! These are the raw data codes that were used to generate the summary data on the printouts, including the ones with the little plus, which are the ones of interest to Ben. They indicate the parts that, that are charred. He is studying fire in the swamps in the high oxygen content of the time. So all I need to do is to save it. And we are done! That's a good story. So you have you have the actually the setup over here. Yeah. So after Antoine realized we could translate the data um, to ASCII from the mainframe encoding, uh, he built us a computer setup with Cindy uh, in Paris in his house there, where he has a number of old computers and a, a, a plethora of old computer parts. Uh, so he put this setup together and then shipped it over in a couple boxes. And then we built it up here with the eight inch drive that you guys repaired uh, mm -hmm. at your house. And from there, it was really plug and go for reading the floppy data out. Oh. So I got through 320 floppies in three days. Uh, and that was that, we have the data as digital. Sweet. <clears throat> and so we saw these data and we knew right away they were data. And then as soon as we realized that it was telling us for each square centimeter what you actually saw in this thing, we were incredibly excited. <clears throat> yeah, and Evo and I spent the rest of the day figuring out how the files are structured and, and how what each part of the entry means. And we were able to figure all of that out in, in a couple of hours, which was great. And then as I went back to Illinois this last time, we actually found the key to, and it matched what we had already thought, and it added a little bit more information, which was great. Yeah, so these are what the output files look like. Mm -hmm. And right here, we have an identifier for the individual cobol peel. So those peels that I were holding up, that I was holding up earlier, mm -hmm. each one gets a unique identifying number mm -hmm. that also relates it back to the cobol, the actual chunk of rock mm -hmm. that it was taken from. So you can go from this information to the rock that it was that it came from, 
And then it has a bunch of other information about which state this was collected in, um, what coal bed it is associated with, etc. So all of that information is embedded in this this so header here. So he invented a, a system to make a concise <coughs> notation. The guy was ahead of his time by yeah. a huge amount. Right? Yeah. So every cobalt peel starts with a header like this. And then after that header, there's always a one. Mm -hmm. And then there's the data for that peel. And then at the end of that individual peel, there's a zero. So all these data are from one peel. And here you can see for each square centimeter, again, for the first square centimeter, this is the genus, mm -hmm. this is the species, and then this is telling you that it's part of the cortex. So that's the part of the plant that you're looking at. And we're seeing that it's co connected continuously with the second square centimeter. And that's why they appear on the same line. That is always the case when they appear on the same line. If you have something that doesn't appear with, uh, that only has one thing on that line, it means it wasn't continuous. It, it was just didn't a appear in the next square. So, so the guy invented a whole system to uh, yeah. have a very concise notation. It's and this amazing, is always exactly 11 characters. Um, not all of the spots are always used, mm -hmm. but there's always 11 characters for one observation Fixed entry. format. Yeah, and then what I, the other thing that I was looking for, I haven't seen it in this cobalt peel. Probably the mark for whether it's burnt. <coughs> yeah, or the mark for whether it's burnt or not. Here it is. So, if you have a plus here, this chunk was actually fossilized charcoal. You can still identify the plant that you're looking at, the mm -hmm. species, and the tissue, because charcoal is still the plant material, right? Mm -hmm. In some cases, it burns to being unrecognizable, but generally speaking, you can still identify what you're wow. looking at. And so we have, for thousands and thousands of uh, centimeters, information about which plants burned. Uh, and overall, the data set includes over 700,000 square centimeters of observed area. Well, it was quite rewarding to have succeeded in helping these passionate scientists in a relatively short amount of time, and I hope you have enjoyed the adventure too. But it does not end there, as I had the opportunity to visit the multi-talented Antoine a short time later in Paris, where his life interests are equal parts fossils, antique computers, and keyboard instruments. Hopefully I'll be able to share that with you in an upcoming video.